Okay, everybody, good afternoon. All right, welcome to uh, Flex Day Walk the Talk afternoon keynote presentation. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. William Allen Young. William Allen Young, let me get that right. I'm going to say it a lot of times in the intro. Mr. William Allen Young is a true leader who rose from humble beginnings in an inner city dwelling to achieve success and national fame as an acclaimed American actor, director, motivational speaker, and visionary leader. Mr. Young is recognized by millions of worldwide fans as Frank Mitchell, the loving father on the long-running TV series Moesha, or as Judge Ratner on CSI Miami. His acting career includes starring roles in more than 90 television, stage, and film productions, including two Academy Award-nominated films, A Soldier's Story, and District 9. He has truly diversified the arts and entertainment community among the ranks of actors, directors, writers, and producers in Hollywood. One of seven siblings, Mr. Young was born in my hometown, Washington, D.C., and raised in South Central Los Angeles. His mother taught him the value of hard work and continued education, but more importantly, how to follow your dream. One of Mr. Young's most notable accomplishments was leading USC to a national championship. And no, it wasn't in football. He led the debate squad to a national championship, and he was the first African American to be named the number one college speaker in the nation for two consecutive years. Outstanding. Mr. Young holds a master's degree in sociolinguistics, a bachelor's degree in rhetoric and debate, and has lectured at colleges and universities throughout the nation. As the founder and director of the Young Center for Academic and Cultural Enrichment, he inspires the lives of young people from South Los Angeles to South Africa through his LA-based nonprofit organization. Under his leadership, the organization has served the educational needs of more than 15,000 diverse youth and has created opportunities for hundreds of economically challenged youth to realize their dream of obtaining a college education. And I think that deserves a round of applause as well. <laughs> Today, Mr. Young is in demand as a professional motivational speaker for such diverse organizations as Northrop Grumman, the NAACP, Raytheon, American Federation of Teachers, Western Association of College Admissions Counselors, New York State Public Schools, and the California Community College System. Mr. Young has received numerous of awards and was recently inducted into the African American Hall of Education and deemed a goodwill ambassador by former President Bill Clinton. With all of this, he is most proud to be a, a devoted husband of 25 years and a loving father and role model to he and his wife's two sons. With all that he has going on, we are grateful that Mr. Young could be here with us this afternoon. I find him truly inspiring and know that you will too. With that, please join me in giving a great big Long Beach City College welcome to the man with a smile made for television, Mr. William Allen Young. Thanks, Byron. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and, and thank you so much, Byron. I appreciate you. Uh, and, and just cherish you for the work that you've been doing and also for making me aware of this forum and inviting me to participate. Uh, I've been traveling quite a bit lately. So if during the talk I say, how are you doing out there, Detroit? You'll know why. <laughs> I think that one of the things that is so important about this conversation, uh, I had one in New York with a group of kids, parents, uh, and counselors, and now I'm speaking to a group of educators and staff at a community college here, as opposed to Seminole, Oklahoma, where I was two weeks ago, where they have peculiar issues with the Cherokee tribe and how to reach out and embrace them and make them feel uh, accepted so that they excel academically. I don't know how many Cherokee Indians we have here, but the issue is similar. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's an issue that is near and dear to my heart. It is near and dear to my heart because of my upbringing as the son of Joan and Roger Young, uh, growing up under their values for education in a sense that we all belong to the same group, that we, in a sense, are an extension of the same family. I take that to heart. 
And I take it to heart in every sector of our society, certainly in everything that I do. And so I look to see it reflected uh, in every place I go. It's not always the case, but that's the ideal. That's what we work toward, which is why this conference is so important. In order for you to truly know uh, me, or certainly know me better than, than my introduction, I have to introduce you to my mother. Uh, my mother, Joan Walker, uh, was a woman who herself was abandoned as a child uh, in Anderson, South Carolina, but very strong-willed, determined, and very bright young lady. Uh, she went to school until the uh, eighth grade, uh, and then she had to be transported to Washington, D.C., because her mother was dying. Uh, and in the hospital there, when she arrived, they told her two things. Uh, one, she knew. You are going to have to drop out of school and take care of the younger siblings. She was the oldest. It's just the way it was. Folk in the country have those morals and they hold on to them for generations. And they told her that you have to take care of the children and so you have to forfeit the rest of your education to do that. And so she went home and started taking care of the kids. Now mind you, before this happened, she was a straight A student in Anderson, South Carolina. Her goal was to become a teacher one day at that point. But family circumstances dictated that she had to drop out. So my mother technically was a dropout. Uh, she got married, uh, met a handsome man named Roger Young in Washington, D.C., and they started a family. Uh, from them, seven children uh, came. I am the third from the top. And those seven children all got together and squeezed into an old Model T Ford with a hole in the bottom, gas fumes coming up all the way, and traveled 3,000 miles across the country heading west for better times when my father job, father's job dried up. So that's how we got to Los Angeles. When we got to Los Angeles, my mother said, I have to start working. She applied for jobs. She's a dropout. And the only job that she could get was as a maid. So I have to tell you, my mother was by profession a maid. She used to go to folks' houses and clean them, uh, sweeping and mopping floors, cleaning walls, uh, toilets, bathrooms, you know the drill. But she never stopped believing in the power and the value of education. And so to her children, she passed on this value. When my mother would come home, uh, she would rest for about five minutes and then she would go to the cupboards and she would grab all of the rags we had there, and she says, everybody line up. Now, we knew what that meant. My mother would have all seven children line up, and as we came by single file, she would pass out all these rags to us. And as she had passed them out to us, we started wrapping them around our knees and around our elbows and one in our hand. And then in the open hand, she would give us a, a big gob of, of wax because we had hardwood floors. Some of you may not know about that. <laughs> and on those hardwood floors, you had to take care of them. There was no maid at our home. And so we used to take that wax and take those rags and we would line up, line up behind my mother, single file. My father at this time, by the way, was in the hospital sick. He was there for over a year. So it was my mother and seven children. And she said, everybody down. So we'd all get down on our hands and our knees, elbows, knees, and wax. And she would say it now, you know the drill, wax on, <laughs> wax off, <laughs> wax on, wax off. Now that was the easy part. And then as we began, she said, repeat after me, get a good education before you get Old, a good education is better than gold. Gold and silver may wash away, but a good education will never decay. She learned that poem when she was in Anderson, South Carolina. Her grandmother taught it to her and said, don't ever stop the lifelong pursuit of education. And so even this maid, as she was then, taught that same poem to her children. She said, let's go get a good education before we get old. Now, by the way, in my culture, we sometimes put a little yeast in it and let it rise. <laughs> they call it swagger now. <laughs> so we all had a little swagger. Mine was, get a good education 
before you get old. Good education is better than gold. Gold and silver been washed away, but a good education will never decay. Get a good education before you get old. <laughs> now, two amazing things happened because of this. The first, as you can imagine, is that we had the shiniest floors in Watts. <laughs> the second one was that we learned, and I hold it to this day, an enduring value for the power of education to transform lives. Now hold on, the story gets better. If you recite that and you teach it to your children as my mother did, you hear the words long enough that you feel that your life is incomplete. How can you teach that to your children unless you yourself, who are still alive and able, go back and do the same thing? So my mother went back to school at night at Jordan High School in Watts. I know she was there because I was sitting next to her. I had uh, gotten a, uh, a bad grade in chemistry. So I had to go to night school and my mother was sitting next to me, getting A's again. It marveled me to watch her. She got her high school diploma and said, I feel good, I'm not gonna stop here. So she went to a community college, LA Trade Technical College, in law, come on Trade Tech. <laughs> And there, she enrolled in a nursing program. And my mother completed the nursing program, passed the state nursing exam, and retired 30 years later as the chief surgical nurse for Kaiser Hospital on Cadillac in Los Angeles. If you take out of that equation the education component my mother is a maid. If you take that out, it is the one transforming piece that changed her life. We saw it firsthand, and so I believe it intently. Well, that's the kid that I am, all grown up, and I still believe in that power of education, but access is key to make that happen. 1954 decision by the Supreme Court to end segregation in school was pivotal because it gave people of color who had been denied access a sense of hope that finally what we need to transform our lives was available to us. The more doors that opened after that to women, to the disabled, American Disability, with Disabilities Act, to people who had been shut out, it then made the, the, the playing field level to the extent that if you wanted it, it was there. It was no plaything, this, because if you take that education component piece out, you have a cyclical situation where generation after generation after generation of young people will simply become the janitors and the maids of society. Education makes that picture different. Access is so important to that that those who have been denied access feel welcome in that environment, they will come in droves and they will perform to the standard of excellence that they have become accustomed. One of the things that I think is so important in talking to educators is I am talking to the very people who provide the service to those young people once they get to school. In the case of community colleges, young and not so young, but all coming for the same reason. If we think about teachers, the one thing that I, I'm often confused about is when I look at the job descriptions, there is no specific indication about anything that you must do besides disseminating information. And so many teachers simply read the job description and very literally simply disseminate information. People in service programs read the job description and basically simply hand out information and that's it. Service is not necessarily a part of that. The faster our society goes, service is becoming less and less a part of that. So there are many teachers, professors, who simply lecture, hand out syllabi, and say there'll be a test on Friday. As if the information dissemination is all they are required to do, and technically it is. One of the many jobs that I've had over the years is working in a personnel department for the Veterans Administration in Los Angeles, Westwood. And I was a personnel staffing specialist for two years. And while I was there, I 
found out about a book which is the Bible of personnel. It's called the Dictionary of Occupational Title. Some of you know about that, the dot. In that book, it has a description of just about every job you can think of from A to Z. And if it's not in there, guess what? We created it and wrote the job description for it. And here's something that was even equally beautiful. We could take a magic marker and erase some stuff and change the job description. Why is that important? Because right now I'm going to change your job description if you're a teacher. Please allow me. Information dissemination, we're going to hold on to that, but we're going to just put it to the side. Something more important, gatekeeper. You are a gatekeeper. Even better than that, a miracle worker. Sound too deep? You can do it. Hold on. Now, what is a gatekeeper? Somebody who controls access to something, usually a vital piece of something. It can be information, but not limited to that. A gatekeeper is a person who has been put in a position to control access to something. Whether I'm in the financial aid department, admissions, or whether I'm your professor who says that I know you need this grade to get into law school or whatever, I control access to that. You are gatekeepers. The definition is consistent so far. A gatekeeper, though, can either allow access or deny access. In the past, when people were shut out, access was denied. The gatekeeper said, mm -mm, we have it, it's wonderful, we're not going to share it with you. There are some teachers who still do the same thing unknowingly. Another thing that I did in my lifetime was I served in the United States military. I was a Marine. A couple of Marines in the room. You know, a few good men and all of that. I was one of them. <laughs> Went to boot camp in San Diego, an amazing thing happened. Now, why would I go into the military? Yes, I am patriotic. Yes, I understand the importance of that, but I'm not a soldier. I'm not. I went in because our house was shrinking. We were growing and the house was shrinking. And there literally was nowhere for me to go after high school. I was unfocused. I hadn't put everything together yet. I wanted to go somewhere, didn't know how to get there. So I went into the military. It was the best thing that could happen to me. In boot camp, the United States military, by the way, has the toughest boot camp out of all the services. If you don't know that, know it. It is a boot camp that weeds everybody out. If you can't make it, they know day one. It's 80 days of hell. That's what they call it. Exactly 80 days. On the fifth day, I'm there on guard duty. While everybody is sleeping, every four hours we change guards. From two to six in the morning, that was my guard duty. The one thing you can never do is sleep on guard duty. I slept. <laughs> the drill instructor, whose room is right there because he sleeps there too, opens his door quietly and I hear the creak. And I look up and he's standing over me and I was asleep. You can get a dishonorable discharge for that. So I jumped up real quick and didn't try to pretend that I was awake. He said, as you were, private, as you were. They call us private. You lose your name. He said, as you were. He says, what are you doing here? I said, sir, we have to refer to ourselves as private. Sir, the private was not sleeping. Um, <laughs> the private was reading a book. He says, as you were. Listen to the question, private. What are you doing here, private young? And I did that like animals do when they're a little confused. He says, I've been here for 17 years, never quite seen one like you. What are you doing here? That was a long time ago, and I'm sharing it with you today because it is probably the most important question to ask your students who are in front of you. What are you doing here? It doesn't suggest that you don't need to be here, but what it does cause them to do is to think not only about where they are, but where they are going. Community colleges are just a stop along a long journey to get to somewhere else. For many of them, if no one poses the question, they don't think about it. 
I thought about it and I realized, what am I doing here? And what I was doing very simply was that I was running away. I was hiding. I was hiding. From what? From the real world. Because I knew once I got out there, I had to perform and I wasn't ready to perform. Many of the students who come to the community college system are hiding. They have to be outed. They have to be outed by those whose job it is to be the gatekeepers. And how do you out someone? That drill, drill instructor saw something in me. For him to pose the question, no, listen again, what are you doing here, Private Young? No one else, you. It means he saw something in me that I could not even see in myself. It means that as a gatekeeper, he took the responsibility to pose the question because having seen it, he wondered, why are you in the military? Unless you're super patriotic, you should be in college. You're smart, you're sharp, you're witty, critical thinking off the scale. Look at these test numbers. What are you doing here? So as soon as I got out of the military, I checked into college, and I never stopped. I knew before I got out of the military, but I honored my service. I signed that contract. But as soon as I got out, jet back into college. From high school, where I got out with about a 2.1 to straight A's, I only got one B the entire time I was in college, all the way through graduate school. So I was always capable of it. But what it took was some shaking, somebody to out me, to get me to think about it. Otherwise, I'd be in the military or selling shoes or a maid or a janitor somewhere. Nothing wrong with those jobs, but that's not what I wanted. It would have been a default position for me. You know, I think already, that's most of your students. It doesn't matter what the demographic, black, white, brown, red, yellow, all of them predominantly come to community colleges because they are searching. They don't know where they want to go. Some of them might be a little more specific. I'm going to take the nursing program and I'm going on to become a nurse. I'm going to take these undergraduate courses and I'm going to matriculate to a four-year college. Okay, but that's not the majority of your students. You probably have heard this. The Student Act, a Success Act, Senator uh, 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 Lowenthal, that was just passed, it said, we need to improve student completion rates in states, 112 community colleges. 54% of all community college students fail to earn a certificate, associate degree, or transfer within six years of attending a community college. Why? Because they're hiding and they have found the ultimate hiding place. Why? Because it's credible. You don't hide in a drug house, it's not credible. <laughs> if, you don't, if you're not a soldier, you don't go hide there, you hide in a community college. Easy access, people respect you, and you don't intend to do anything, but you can hang out for six years <laughs> without anybody saying, hey, what are you doing here? That should be day one. Day one, teachers, I suggest on the first day of school, it doesn't matter what your subject is, it's irrelevant. Have your students write a short essay telling you what they are doing there. And make it interesting, not just in your class, although if you choose to do that, that's interesting too. That'll give you some specific information. But more generally, what are you doing at this community college? Paint a picture for me that makes sense. Now you know what you just did, you stepped out of that old definition of your job title and into the new one, because you are now a miracle worker. What is a miracle? Something amazing that happens. I'll tell you what's amazing, when you can transform a life, when you can turn on a light, when somehow you can usher in an epiphany in someone's life, that, my friends, is lightning in a bottle. You can't teach that, as they say. If you have the ability to do that, you are a powerful person and you are good for the entire planet because that's what mentors do. That's what gatekeepers do. That's why you're in that position in case we miss the mark. Those of you who saw, like movies as I do, you probably saw The Matrix. How many did? Yeah, all three of them. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't like the second one. They, they were pretty good though, all three. In The Matrix, the lead character is who? 
Okay, Neo. And Neo is on a journey, not unlike the students at the community college. And Neo's journey is to discover what? My man, his purpose. To discover his purpose. In 1969, throughout the United States, they did a study of incoming freshmen that year to ask them what was the reason they were going to college. 78% in 69 said that they came to discover their purpose in life. 1969, and keep in mind, it was a conscious time. It was the 60s. 78% of them. 30 years later, 1999, they did a similar survey. Can you guess what the predominant reason for going to college was? To get, a job. to get a job and make money. I'm preaching to the choir, I know that. And sometimes the choir forgets the words to the song, the rhythm to the, to the beat. <laughs> to get a job and make money. I, I'm not here to judge that. But what I'm saying is there is a difference. Something changed. Neo wanted to find his purpose. So the first thing that happened is Morpheus gets him in and says, you got to see a whole lot of people. We got to take you to the oracle, and then you got to see the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, uh, the gatekeeper. You got to see a few other people. Then you got to talk to the guy who created the whole thing so that you can discover your purpose. And once you discover it, you will become powerful. Motion will happen in your life. Not stagnation, not six years at a community college, not time in the military. You will become proactive because the, life, the purpose-driven life is one that doesn't wait for permission. It knows where it's going. But Neo had to find one person who was the key to unlocking all of it. That one character was the gatekeeper. The writer, who by the way is a woman, an African-American woman, actually wrote The Matrix. It's a long lawsuit, and the judges said, yeah, you did. But so she started doing interviews because they said, well, why did you write it? And she says, well, the most important character in the whole thing was the gatekeeper. She says, I hide that because people think it's Neo. The reason why, you take the gatekeeper out, Neo never, ever solves the riddle of The Matrix and never discovers his purpose, the gatekeeper, the gatekeeper. The Wizard of Oz, you guys saw that? Beautiful movie. Let me borrow something from it. You got Dorothy from Kansas, right? And the thing hits her upside the head. She goes unconscious. There's this terrible tornado takes her up to a place called Oz. She's lost. And when she gets up there, the good witch comes out, looking very nicely, and says, you have to go see the wizard. The wizard can answer all of your questions and solve all your problems. And then she asked the munchkins, how do I get to the wizard? They said, follow the yellow brick road. So she takes off on the yellow brick road, and she meets the scarecrow and the tin man and the cowardly lion. And each one of them has a deficiency. Hold on to that. Has a deficiency. And they say, oh, well, if he can solve your problem, maybe he can solve mine. So they go to the tin man. I don't have a heart. Oh, okay, no problem. The wizard can give you a heart. He'll give me a brain. Send her home. They run into the cowardly lion. And they say, cowardly lion. You don't have courage, let's go see the wizard. So all of them take off to go see the wizard. Forget the wicked witch, that's not a part of my story. But they're going to see the wizard, and then when they get there, clear that he can give them what they need, what does he do? Does he give it to them? Oh, you don't want to jump ahead, huh? It's okay. Most people think that the wizard solved their problems. Play the tape back. When the wizard got the scarecrow in front of him, he simply reminded the scarecrow of how brilliant he already was, showed him how he had proven that on the road to Oz. But he said, but if you feel that you need it, I'll give you this certificate, and you now I have a doctorate in honorific abilitude in the <laughs> And he took it, he said, yeah, that's cool. And he spouted off something beautiful. And then all of a sudden he came to the Tim and he said, look, you already are compassionate. You are the most compassionate of all. Let me play the tape back for you to prove you already had it and you proved it on the way to Oz, cowardly lion. You brave rascal, you, with the big pink bow right there. <laughs> you showed more courage than anyone. In fact, you saved everyone's life. But if you feel you need it, I'll give you an award. And then he hung an award on him and he liked that. Told the tin man, I'll give you this red heart if it'll make you feel better. The whole point of it was that he had to get to Dorothy. 
And he told Dorothy, I don't know how to handle your situation. Well, in comes the good witch again and said, all you have to do was just click your heels three times and say there's no place like home. In essence, you never left home. It was already there. Tin man, I can't give you a heart. You have it already. Scarecrow, with all of that fuzzy stuff out there, I don't give you a brain. I don't make you smart. You're already smart. Cowardly lion, I don't make you courageous. With all of you, all I simply do, and that is my job as the gatekeeper, is to remind you how smart, how compassionate. All of that stuff is already in your students. I don't know what this does to your egos. You don't make anybody smart. You probably already know that. But here's the problem in education in our country. It is built on a platform of condescension. The teacher knows everything, the students know nothing. The least experience, the less experience the teacher has, it is usually demonstrated in how much they try to dominate or control their class because they don't want to accept the fact that the students already have knowledge before they come to you. They don't come to you to make them smart. They may think that, but don't own that responsibility. It's not yours. Got a joke. My son always likes for, for us to tell jokes. So he says, all right, Dad, start off with a joke. I didn't start off with a joke, but here's the joke right here. So little kid, Billy, inquisitive, mischievous kid, is sitting in the back of the room, and the teacher is doing a math assignment. It's addition. So it's real simple. He says, listen, I'm going to do a math assignment. Who wants to help me? Billy. He says, okay, Billy, Billy. Billy runs up all excited. He says, okay, I'd love to do math. And this is addition. I'm good at addition. So he says, all right, Billy, just settle down, settle down. All right, class, it's real simple. Now, in addition, I have one rabbit. And I'm going to give that rabbit to Billy. Billy, hold out your hand. Billy held out his hand, and he handed Billy the imaginary rabbit. He says, okay. He says, Billy. You have the rabbit? He says, yeah, yeah. He says, okay, now I'm going to give Billy one more rabbit. I've given him one. I'm going to give him one more rabbit. He gives him the second imaginary rabbit. He says, and now, Billy, tell us all, how many rabbits do you have? And Billy smiled and said, I have three rabbits. <laughs> and the man said, no, 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 Billy, let's try it again. All right, I'm going to hand you one rabbit, right? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he hands him the rabbit. He said, how many rabbits did I hand you? He said, one. He says, I'm going to hand you a second rabbit. He hands him the rabbit. He says, Billy, how many rabbits have I handed you? He said, you handed me another one. How many rabbits did I hand you total? Two. How many rabbits do you have? Three. <laughs> so he got tired of that and finally asked Billy, Billy, if I hand you one rabbit, then I hand you another rabbit, one rabbit plus one rabbit equals what? He said, three rabbits. He says, how do you have three rabbits? He said, because I already have a rabbit at home. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> of course, there's a method in my madness. Your students already have a rabbit. They do. You hand them your rabbit. You don't hand it to them in a vacuum. They may not know where they're going, but they're sharp. When we honor that, what we do is we acknowledge the truth, but we also, out of that respect, engender them to us. We bring them to us because you acknowledge that there's somebody before they come to you. Your role as the gatekeeper is to give them a little bit more. Give them another rabbit. Now the next person has to reckon with this person with two rabbits. And then three, and then four, and then five. One of the things that I think is so important about teaching is just understanding that every one of your students comes to you with a deficit. You therefore don't have the luxury as the teacher who lectures at Yale or Harvard where we think that they've got it all together. We are dealing with students that have deficits. If you're a coach and you have football players, basketball players or whatever, these are not blue chip players. Duke has them. North Carolina has them. They don't come to community colleges. Think about that. Those players are people who still love the game. They just want to play. Now, every now and then, you might get a standout who didn't do well academically on the, uh, uh, the, the standardized test, so they come here to kind of get it together, and then they take off. We hear about that. That's 1% of 1%.
You don't get the cream of the crop. You get people who have deficits, people who have doubts, people who don't know where they're going, which means that you as an instructor are required even more so to put something into their bag, to inquire upon them, what are you doing here? You have to be teacher slash gatekeeper slash miracle worker slash mentor. A lot of people coming to the community college system don't know that. It's a good job. I'm not saying you get rich doing it. My wife works for the community college system. But I am saying that you are in the best possible position to be a game changer. I went to USC. Not a whole lot of my professors were game changers. In fact, not one of them. I went to El Camino College and took one class, and Professor Lee, whose name I repeat to you today, was a game changer. He said, William, you speak well. Have you ever considered debate? I said, debate? He said, yes, debate. <laughs> we had that kind of conversation for an hour. <laughs> He said, we're starting a debate team. We don't have anybody on it. You could be the first person. I said, OK, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> That's how I won the title at USC. I got a full scholarship to USC because I was debating for El Camino College. Because Professor Lee said, you ever hear of debate? A game changer. A game changer. At the community college, there are infinitely more game changers than anywhere. They're finished with high school, not, going, not yet where they're going to go. You are at the gate. You are the guardians. Sometimes if we don't do a good enough job in community college, they leave us after those six years and go nowhere, absolutely nowhere. The majority of the students here are hiding. Think about that. If you think then that my job is to first discover something about them, that brings me closer to where they are, instead of requiring them to jump through hoops to get to where I am, you have a good position to start off with with all students. Teaching strategies for non-traditional students. The one thing that I, for some reason blows people's minds when I say it, it's very simple to me. It doesn't matter what race, culture, gender, disability, non-disability, it doesn't matter who the student is. If you treat them all with the same prescription, they will all grow from the experience. Now hold on to that. It is an oversimplification. And yes, certain groups have certain needs, but think about what I'm getting ready to give you and see if it's, it isn't overarching enough to say, wait a minute, whatever specific strategies I have for individual groups, this is a no-brainer no matter who I'm dealing with. Hold on. High expectations, all groups. Inspirational teaching, all groups. Support and belief. That belief part means that you must believe in your students. You absolutely must. If you don't, they'll know it. And they're sharp. Remember, they got a rabbit. They will know day one if you don't like them. And see, here is where our own human failings become transparent. If you got an issue with young black males, it's going to show. If you got an issue with women, it's going to show. You cannot hide that. It is evident in your behavior towards the student. And if they sense it even in the slightest, they will distance themselves from you. Teacher, before the students come, you got to look in the mirror yourself. You have to ask yourself, what do I think about my students? If we have low expectations of certain groups, they will know it. Our teaching strategies are based on assumptions. Think about this. It doesn't matter what you teach or who you are. Even if you think you got it together, this is true. Your teaching strategies and how you behave towards students is based on your assumption about that student, that group, or that class. I've heard two teachers around the water cooler saying, God, I can't stand that third period class. Those are the dumbest kids, but they'll brighten at the fourth period class. You think the kids in that third period class don't know that? Take a look at the grades by comparison with the students in the third grade class and the fourth grade class. You get D's and F's there, you get A's and B's here. They are capable of A's and B's, 
but they respond to you. They're searching. If you have low expectation for certain students or groups, you expect less of them. Now follow this. You lower the bar immediately to where you think they are. You provide them with an inferior education which you think they can handle. And you're not surprised if they don't succeed. That's what you expect of them. If you have high expectations, we go to the other end of the spectrum. You expect the best of your students. You teach, you engage, you inspire them to achieve excellence and success. And you are genuinely disappointed if they do not. You expect them to succeed. You have to look in the mirror and ask yourself if you harbor any subconscious tendencies to believe in your assumptions before the student comes to your class that he or she or they are underachievers. Because if so, whether you know it or not, your teaching will follow your belief. And remember, they got a rabbit, they will see it. It doesn't matter if they're African American, Latino, disabled, whatever, any protected group. They will know it. Why? Because they have seen it all their lives. They don't expect it from you because it's a college environment. Also, they're so desperate, so hopeful, they don't expect it. When they see it, no time to analyze it, they dismiss you. Oprah Winfrey did a documentary, some of you may have seen it, on education. There were students at a predominantly African-American school, public school, in Chicago. Across town, there were students who were primarily Caucasian who were in a public school. People thought it was a private school. It was a public school. Same school system. The students from the African-American school, I'll call it that to generalize, the ones in the leadership class were taken to the school that was primarily Caucasian. The ones that were Caucasian were taken to the African-American school. Now, let me get rid of race for a second and put it like this. The kids from the poor school were sent to the rich school. The kids from the rich school were sent to the poor school. And they did this for a semester. And they took the cameras in. The students who were the absolute A students, one of them was a valedictorian of the class, the other was salutatorian, already selected. These students did absolutely poorly in the other school. The students from here who came over there said, you got to be kidding me, when the teacher started to lecture. They said, this is elementary stuff. That elementary stuff is what the student who was the valedictorian over here was getting as the highest stuff. I told you about you in your classroom. Think about this. A whole school or a whole school district who sees a whole group of students as inferior. And so the school that they go to, the teachers they get, the supplies that they get or don't get is based on the assumption that they're not going anywhere. You get it? You get it. And yet the students over here are no more intelligent, no less intelligent. They had a full Olympic-sized swimming pool. They had two jacuzzis that could fit 20 people each. They had electronic everything at their disposal. They had the smart boards. They had computers. Each one of them had a laptop. Nothing wrong with that. Everybody wants that, but they didn't have it. Somebody made a decision based on an assumption they're not going anywhere. Now think about this. I know this has to be true. Because if somebody assumed that they were going somewhere, uh-uh, you don't have this, you have that. If they're both public schools. You don't have this, you have that. That was the point that Oprah was trying to make. Education inequity is not just unfair and illegal. It is desperately inhumane. Because you doom students who are brilliant to a life of mediocrity. I'll tell you who really proved this, the Hoover Think Tank, connected to Stanford University. They did a test in 1976, incredible test. If you've heard me speak, this is the test to me that was a deal changer. It was in behavior modification, not unlike Pavlov's dog, except for the subject in this experiment was a flea, a flea. Why did they pick a flea? Because what can a flea do better than anybody else or anything else? It can leap, it can jump. If a flea was a human being, they estimate that that human being would be able to jump over three football fields. One jump. 
So they got all of these fleas over a period of time. They incubated them. They had millions of fleas. So what they did was they built these containers, clear glass containers, and they put the fleas in the container. Microphone situated at the top of the container, and they put a top, a lid at, on, on the container. Huge container. Fleas started jumping because that's what fleas do. Bing! 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 Millions of fleas jumping. And how did they know? Because they recorded it with the microphones every time the flea hit the top. Bing! 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 That's how many fleas were jumping because fleas were doing what they are capable of doing. They said, okay. After a while, though, fewer fleas hitting the top. They're still jumping, but they realized where the ceiling was. So they started jumping a little less than that. Fleas not stupid. They have a rabbit, if a flea can have a rabbit. Well, rabbits have fleas, I'm sorry. <laughs> so after a while, nothing. So they say, okay. They take the top off, change the container, smaller container, lower lid. A little while later, a little while later, these are just the hard-headed fleas, the stubborn ones. <laughs> and then finally, Hits. <laughs> Nothing. It worked. The hypothesis was proven. If you lower the bar low enough, you can take a living thing and retrain it to do something it totally was trained to do in its DNA. You can make it do something that even the creator of life would say, what? <laughs> what are you doing? That's what fleas do. They destroyed their ability to leap because the fleas believed that there was a ceiling over their head. They got smaller and smaller, so their desire to leap or their belief in leaping changed. School systems. These kids become the maids. These kids run the world. Do you realize that's why over a period of time you go on certain college campuses and you don't see diversity? My wife and I just took our son to the University of Arizona. The African American population is so small, we didn't see another black person for two days. I don't think that's because no African Americans want to go to the University of Arizona. It's a good school. I like it. My son is there. But the truth is, systemically, you don't need a backroom conspiracy. Because it's already set up in the experiment, eventually you just take the tops off. Those better trained will go on. Those less trained will not. I think that one of the things that we have to realize, too, is that's taking on a huge task to try to change the whole deal. You don't have to right away. I believe in small successes. I believe that each and every one of you, especially who are teachers or counselors, every time that one student is sitting in front of you, that's a chance to change the world. That one student. You can do that. Dr. William Shockley in the 1960s, you guys probably remember him if you're around my age. You remember Dr. Shockley, who was a, a physicist from Stanford University, stepped out of his field and came, by the way, a Nobel Prize winner for work on the transistor. Had nothing to do with human beings. But he came up with a theory that African Americans were genetically inferior to Caucasians, that they inherently did not have the ability or the brain power to think. And not at that level. Now, there were a lot of people who supported him. Assumptions. Imagine being in Dr. Shockley's class if you are African-American. 
If you get a D, he won't say anything. But the student who he thinks will get an A, if they get a D, he's calling them in for a private conference. You, he expects to fail. His theory says it. You're not capable of it. And he is not even being mean. He's awfully misguided, but he thinks he's doing you a favor. Teachers, don't do your students a favor. Do I have to say that again? Don't think that you are being compassionate because you say the African-American students can get away with less. The Latino students can get away with less. Oh, that poor disabled student get away with less. Now, you have to really fight against this because it's human nature. It's Dr. Shockley. If you truly believe that they got a hard way to go, what do we tend to do? We overcompensate. Uh, Mike, yeah, this was nice. This, this was good. I'm going to give you an A on that. And then you read it, and somebody says, this is D work. The young lady who was a valedictorian, who came over here, she was getting A work over there. Over here, it was a D. They're treating her nicely because she's poor and she's black. Never overcompensate for your students. I can prove that the reverse works. Marva Collins in Chicago in 1978, who started the West Side Preparatory Academy. Do you guys know her story? Marva Collins was a teacher for 14 years in the Chicago public school system. It was atrocious. Students were dying on the vine. What she did was she left that and she started a school of her own. It was a charter school, didn't charge a dime. She took the rejects from this school because she wanted to prove a point. She took the students that were failing, the students that were labeled behavior problems, the students that were even labeled as unteachable. She took them in. Within one year, and CBS did a, a report on this, 60 Minutes. Within one year, her second graders, her second graders were studying Shakespeare, all of his plays. Her fourth graders were reading at a ninth grade level, and all of her students' test scores were off the chart. I'm sorry, did you hear what I said before that? They were the failing ones over here. They were the rejects, incorrigible, incorrigible behavior problems. They're never going to make it, unteachable. She said, really? But she began by telling them, you are brilliant. You are as smart as any other kid. But here I will challenge you to be what you already are. And they rose to the occasion. She required parental input, which helped. In a year, she did that with students who were going to fall off the vine. They might be incarcerated or worse, dead. Jaime Escalante, the subject of the movie Stand and Deliver, at Garfield High School in East L.A. and a community college a, 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 a teacher at East L.A. Community College. He went there to a school at Garfield where they said Latino students could not process advanced algebra. They actually told him that. These are people who were administrators at school. That's scary. They believed it. They didn't blink when they said it. They believed it. Assumptions. So there was no calculus class at Garfield. There was no trigonometry class there. Why? Why would they need it? They're not going anywhere. Your teaching is based on your assumptions. So he says, well, you don't mind me opening up one. And they said, well, go ahead and give it a try. Five students. That's what he started off with. Before he left, there were over 500 students. If you saw the movie, you know that the students at Garfield High School after three years tested as high as any other school in the nation on the AP calculus test. That's a hard test. Those so-called dumb Latinos over in Garfield and East L.A. were off the charts. What he did was he took them out of this little bitty box and kicked the box aside and put them in a big one again and said, I will retrain you how to leap, but don't give me too much credit. You are leapers anyway. I'm just going to remind you that you can. And once he did that, he nurtured and got them to believe that they could, and they did. Over 570 students passed that test in his last year, and then he left. The wheel has already been invented, folks. No need to reinvent it. Don't dumb down your process. Keep your high expectations. Give them plenty of support, and let them know that you believe in them. What students of diverse backgrounds really want to believe is that they are a part of this. If they are and you invite them in, don't change the standards, though. You do them a disservice. Inspire them to leap up to that level. They are capable of it. Remember, you don't give the lion courage. He already has it. Just remind him that he does have it. 
I'm working with a couple of programs. One of them is the Harlem Children's Zone Promise Academy in New York. They're doing a great job with the kids there, and in fact, the entire community. Because what they're doing is taking those students that are not doing well in other places and basically giving them the inspiration, the support, the guidance, and tracking them all the way through college. It's a wonderful program. Again, it was featured on uh, 60 Minutes. Um, I think that one of the things about that, again, it is a blueprint, a template. Uh, in our Young Center, the nonprofit that I founded in 1987, uh, one of the things that we do is create what we call a culture of success. We bring together diverse students from throughout the state of California. They participate in a college residence program during the summer. They live on the campus at USC. We have students from the Nickerson Garden, Garden Housing Projects in Watts, whose parents make an income combined below the federal poverty threshold, sitting right next to a young lady from a very affluent family who, if I tell you her last name, you'll know who her parents are. They work together on a statewide program and even connected with students in South Africa on the project. They were embracing each other after it was over because all of those students discovered one thing. There was no difference. When those standards were the same and everybody was given the same love, the same support, even some of the students said, I can teach you this if you'll teach me that. In working together that way, what we're trying to do is to create a model beyond schools and school districts, but for the entire country. We are segregated still, in most cases, by society, by communities, and so most of our kids don't really go to school together. It's a rare school if it is very diverse. Most, schools, most students go to schools that have maybe two uh, 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 different uh, uh, cultures or races. In those schools, they will not know what's happening on the other side of the fence. We bring them all together. I think that what you're going to realize is you don't pick the students who come to your classroom, but they are all together. You will have those who will be shining stars and those that you will assume with the pants down, sagging, the walk, the talk, the tattoos on the neck. You will make an assumption, oh, this one's not going to make it, but that one over there with the nice outfit on and articulately speaking, they're going to all come to you the kid from the projects and the affluent kid, they're going to all come to you. What we have done is said this is a microcosm of not the artificial world, but the real one. If we can succeed here, you can take that group of diverse young people and come up with a strategy that is overarching enough that it's, you don't have to figure out, well, this person's African-American, I need to study that culture, this person's... Listen, folks, there are over 300 languages spoken at five high schools in Los Angeles. You ain't going to master that. <laughs> Forget about it. You don't have to master that. What you have to master is the art of understanding your position. And look in the mirror and ask yourself about these assumptions. No need to ask yourself now. No need to say it here. It's a private thing. But search yourself. Because if you truly believe that all students are brilliant, as Marva Collins did, and that's why she was successful, you will treat them all that way. You will expect great things from them. And you know what? They will produce great things for you. That's overarching. Forget 300 different languages, all of the different cultures, and, 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 and any of the differences that really start us splitting hairs. Treat every student with respect. Expect great things from every student. When you speak to them, look them in the eye and be honest. Be disappointed if on your watch they fail. And you have to give them the fail so you know the grade. You should be gravely disappointed. You should be like that professor at Southern University who pulled the student outside of class and handed her back her final report and said, this is beneath you. I was there. This is beneath you. I know your mother and father. I taught your mother. How dare you give me this garbage? Take it back. I won't accept it. Do it again. And when you hand it in to me this time, I want to see your family name on it. And she did it again. The same person, Dr. Bernadette Rice, the student, is a professor at the same school, Southern University. But if that teacher didn't say, I will not accept junk on my watch. You're better than that. Yes, you're going so far beyond the job description, but how dare you not? 
When you go back and you visit the, the teacher from your high school or whatever place, do you, do you visit that teacher that sits there and lectures all day and just gives you a fail and walks away, doesn't even know your name? No, you visit that professor who said, how dare you? Because as tough as she was, you know one thing, don't you? She cares about you. She believes in you. That's what every student in your classroom wants to believe. That's what they need. Remember, every student coming comes with a deficit. You can't do everything for them. But if you believe in them, that's a pretty good start. Let me move on to my conclusion. I think that one of the things that I would suggest to you is that you just write down those things that made sense that I talked about today. Make it your list. I don't own anything. None of us own knowledge. It passes through us, and then hopefully we pay it forward some way. Here's what I would say to you. Get to know your students. Day one. Not them get to know you. All of them get to know you. Flip the script. However you do it. Have them write the short essay or whatever. Do it. Get to know your students. Treat all students the same as you would treat your own child. If you wouldn't accept your child failing, don't accept students failing in your class. If you know that that's where they're heading and you know halfway, you bring them in and say, what are you doing here? How dare you fail on my watch? I feel as though I fail, and I cannot fail. Raise the bar and inspire your students to achieve success. They can. Trust them. Give them a shot. Help them discover within themselves that which already exists, but they may not be aware of. Believe in them, even if they don't believe in themselves yet. The Amen group uh, that I, I work with closely and, and just admire, they take young men who may not believe in themselves yet, but they see something in them, like that drill instructor. Their job then is to help that young man eventually see the same thing in himself. Dr. Breland is very, very instrumental with that. Assume all students already have a rabbit. And you're just adding another rabbit to their collection. Ask yourself these questions. What do I truly believe about my students' capacity to learn? Do I have high or low expectations of them? Are these expectations the same for all students? Be honest with yourself. Or just for certain individual students or groups? Be honest with yourself in private, in private. What do my students get from me that they couldn't get from a computer? And I'm going to leave you with that thought. You know the new business model says that if they can get a computer to do the same thing you do, they're going to do it. The reason why? Because it makes good business sense. They do it cheaper, faster. They don't ask for holidays, sick days. They don't get benefits or a salary. You downsize, and at the same time, you fulfill your legal requirement to teach. It's called distant learning. It's a good thing for people who really need it it can become a permanent thing. The first thing I answer when I say, what do I do? What do students get from me that they can't get from a computer? It's this. It's this. It's that. It's don't hand me that garbage. It's how dare you. It's Private Young, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? It's my mother. Get on your knees and let's go. Get a good education. You cannot get that from a computer. You never, ever will. It's your greatest argument for not being replaced by a computer. All of that stuff is the human touch. Don't lose the human touch, teachers. You may not be as dynamic and crazy a person as me, but all of you have the capacity to reach out and touch a student. You don't need to go to school for that. You know how to do it. If you have children, you really know how to do it. Do it in your classroom. Don't worry about crossing a line where, well, maybe I'll lose respect from the students. You'll gain love. They'll respect you. Don't worry about that. They respect their mothers and fathers when they gave them their little spanking when they were kids. They respected them. But you will re really move beyond the point where you are just a disseminator of information. Remember, computers do that. You will become that gatekeeper, that miracle worker. You will become the person who acknowledges that Billy has three rabbits. Before I leave the stage, I really have to thank uh, Byron Breland just for being a magnanimous man and just a wonderful administrator who just really gets it. He really does, and I love him for that. Both.
And also, before I let you go, I want to praise you. I really do, because I know how tough the job is. Hopefully these conferences just offer us a little bit of something to put into our bag. But make no mistake about it, I think you are wonderful. I think you are excellent already. And so I can't make you that. But I will remind you, as the good wizard does, that you have the capacity to do everything I'm saying. And if anything that I've said makes sense, use that. If anything didn't make sense, you say, well, that's, that was nice for him to say, but if that doesn't work for me, that's cool too. At the end of the day, though, just seek to be that better teacher. Those of you who have been here for a while, don't sit on that. There is a tendency to think I got my formula down and I've made this easy for myself. Make it uncomfortable again. Feel that for a moment. That's a good feeling. Be uncomfortable and say, I'm alive again. I'm alive again. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness.